Paul's letter, and um, uh, of course, before we do that, I'm going to um, I'm going to ask for some help, uh, and uh, and we'll get started with some prayer. So, if you will, bow with me, and we'll we'll get started. Well, Father, as we uh, take time out tonight and um, contemplate this incredible passage, first of all, we just acknowledge your presence here with us and. Father, we thank you that you desire to be with us, that you desire to uh, have us be with you forever and ever in your kingdom, as a part of your kingdom. But Father, before that happens, that we get to start that process right now when we uh, decide to, to follow you, follow your son, Jesus Christ, and we believe in him. And Father, we're going to talk a little bit about that tonight. And you know... Uh, when we read the Bible, we can read it as a, as a book and we can try and make sense of it through our own intellect, but um, we fail every time we do that. Father, we need your help. We need your Holy Spirit to guide us. Father, I pray that, um, that you will be speaking tonight, uh, that it's not my words. I can't come up with words that could clearly articulate or or come close to explaining what this is about. But Father, you have a message tonight for us. And, um, and so Father, as we lift uh, these words out of the book, may we hear your voice speaking to us. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Well, um, as I said, we're, we're picking up where we left off last week in chapter 3. Uh, of Paul's letter to the Romans and I'm going to read this first and then we'll kind of go back and take a look at it uh, and I'm only going to read um, 21 through 26 I think there's so much in here I don't think we could possibly get through all of this tonight but uh, if you will listen to this I've got it up on the screen for you here um, but now a righteousness from God apart from law has been made known to which the law and the prophets testify this righteousness from God comes through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. There is no difference, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified freely by His grace through the redemption that came by Jesus Christ. God presented Him as a sacrifice of atonement through faith in His blood. He did this to demonstrate His justice because his forbear in his forbearance he had left the sins committed beforehand unpunished. He did it to demonstrate his justice at the present time so as to be just and the one who justifies the man who has faith in Jesus. You know, uh, just to kind of pull us back into the context of this, I thought it would be uh, helpful, you know, as we kind of look back on 1 through 3, and verse 20, just to sort of reorient ourselves to where we are tonight. And as I said, we've been reading this letter, this important letter that is written by, was written by a missionary to a group of believers in the most important city in the world at the time. He had never been to Rome, but Paul takes time to write this, this young church that's developing in Rome to prepare for uh, what he thinks might be an eventual visit one day on his way to Spain. Now the Church of Rome was probably started by Jewish Christians. Uh, however, as time went by, Gentile Christians became a part of this church as well. And in 49 AD, the emperor at the time drove all of the Christians out of Rome. So for a number of years, this church developed really without a lot of Christian influence. And more and more Gentiles were coming to faith the church continued to grow and then at some point the Jewish Christians uh, returned to Rome and that's when things started to get a little bit tense. So as I said, the, the Jewish Christians had not been influencing this growth in Rome but when they came back these law observing Jewish Christians uh, likely started to have uh, or pick a fight with some of the Gentile Christians that had been in this church all along. Well, he's explaining in chapters 1 through 3, and I guess as a point we should say the, the most of what this argument has been about here to four has been really trying to level a charge both against the Gentiles as well as the Jews that, look, we're all the same. 
But that suggests that at this point that there is a, 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 a lot of sort of infighting going on and that it's threatening the church. Think about the fact that Rome, Rome is at the time, it's, it's the center of the known world. Um, and people that lived in Rome were very proud of that. So there's a pride on the, on the part of the Gentiles just out of being Roman. And then there's a pride, a religious pride expressed by the Jewish Christians. And when these two people come together, this two, these two groups come together, you know that there, are ten, there is tension. Uh, and, and a lot of it stems from the pride that both have. So he's been explaining in chapters 1, 3, 3 that it doesn't matter who you are. We are all under sin and there's really nothing we can do about it. Paul argues that all people are in bondage to sin and in need of rescue. Now when you think of the word sin, what do you think of? What would you say, just think to yourself, what would you say is the worst sin that you have ever committed? Does it compare to the sins of others? That's not really a fair question. In fact, it's a bit of a trick question, but it kind of gets to the heart of what Paul is talking about here. We're not really about comparing sins here because we're all sinners and in need, as I said, of a Savior. In a recent article titled The Depth of My Depravity, Tim Challies wrote that my depravity is not measured in the unrighteous deeds that I commit. Sin is not simply doing bad things. No sinful act that I can commit is as severe as my utter rejection of God. The sin I commit, and there are many, are just a symptom of the larger problem that I have. So Paul has demonstrated that no one is righteous, no one seeks God. In fact, all have turned away, he said in the first chapter of Romans. He concludes his argument now showing that the whole world, the whole world is guilty. As Russ pointed out, it's guilty and it needs to be held accountable for its sin. So do we recognize the problem of sin in our own lives? The problem is not just the effect that it has on you and me. The problem is not the effect that it has on others. The problem really is the effect that it has on God. See, sin arouses God's anger. In chapter 1, Paul wrote that God's wrath is being revealed not only now, but also in the future. The more that we sin, the more of God's wrath is stored up. And one day, we'll have to face the full force of God's righteous anger over our sin. As the writer of Hebrews warns us, it's a dreadful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. So what can be done about this problem that we have? What can be done about sin? Is there anything that we can do to turn aside God's anger towards us? And by the way, He's totally justified in being angry towards us. Well, religion says that God forgives and accepts through good works. Work hard. Keep the law. Perhaps God in His kindness will forgive and forget. Worse yet, some may go about their lives comfortable in their sin, believing that their sin doesn't compare to the other really bad things others have committed. Perhaps God is grading on a curve. In his book, The Knowledge of the Holy, A.W. Tozer warns that God's justice stands forever against the sinner in utter severity. The vague and tenuous hope that God is too kind to punish the ungodly has become a deadly opiate for the consciences of millions. It's hushed their hearts and allowed them to practice all pleasant forms of iniquity while death draws every day nearer and the command to repent goes unregarded. As responsible moral beings, we dare not trifle with our eternal future. Well, Paul tries to convince us that religion, which is our efforts to justify ourselves, is nothing more than a wasted effort. We cannot earn God's forgiveness because we can never meet His standards. God's for, uh, the idea of trying to earn God's favor is kind of like trying to swim across the ocean. Now, I, I would imagine that there are several folks in here that would do much better than I would, but in the end, None of us would succeed. We would all fail. There's simply no chance. So the situation 
seems suddenly, suddenly uh, and utterly hopeless. But, the words, but now, Paul begins the most important paragraph perhaps ever written. It's not about what you and I do, but about what God has already done. God Himself in His mercy takes the initiative and acts to deal with our sin, to work out our sin problem. Starting in verse 1, it says, But now, apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been made known, which, to which the law and the prophets testify. The righteousness is given through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. Here God actually provides us with righteousness through Jesus Christ on the basis of faith. God's law declares me guilty. So the righteousness from God must be apart from the law. What's more, the law and the prophets both testify. That is, the Old Testament teaches that righteousness comes only from God and never from me trying to keep the law. We can see this in the first chapter of Romans where Paul quotes the Old Testament prophet excuse me, Habakkuk when he says, For in the gospel a righteousness of God is revealed, a righteousness that is by faith from first to last, just as it is written, the righteous will live by faith. God's righteousness comes from faith. And His righteousness is freely given. Now, it's a gift, and, you know, a gift is not really a gift if we have to contribute anything to it, right? What could I possibly give to God that He can't already do for Himself? I can only become right with God by trusting Him to make me right with Him. I can't do it myself, and He definitely doesn't need my help. You know, I spent all day today, I was telling some friends of mine earlier, all day today, I, I can't tell you one thing that I did starting with, uh, with my first email that I, I responded to where there wasn't some error involved, some form of failure. I sent the wrong file to the right person. I sent the right file to the wrong person. I called some poor guy by the, same, by the wrong name three times separately today. Um, I, uh, I mean, it was just one of those days. And about uh, halfway through it, as I got more and more frustrated, it suddenly dawned on me what God was trying to show me. It was this. It was this being played out in my own life. No matter how hard I try, I'm always going to fail. No matter how hard I try to do the right thing, the wrong thing inevitably gets done. So who gets this free gift? Well, there's no difference, it says, between Jew and Gentile. Verse 23, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and all are justified freely by His grace. There's no distinction. There's no exception. We are all sinners. We all fall short of God's glory. Yet we are all justified freely by His grace, His unmerited favor. We don't deserve it. God owes us nothing. He just does this because He loves us. Not only are our sins forgiven by God, but they are actually wiped away completely, like they never happened. That's what it means to be justified. When God looks at me, it is just as if I've never sinned. As far as my sins being punished, when He looks at me, it's just as I died on the cross. That's what it means to be justified. Again, Tozer says, It's by His grace that God imputes merit where none previously existed and declares no debt uh, to be where one had been before. But how, you might ask, can a holy and righteous God be just and justify persons who have clearly violated His law? What judge would let off the guilty without punishment? Think of the most heinous crime that you can... Uh, that you've heard of, just whatever it is. Now think of the person who committed that crime or the people that committed those crimes. Now think of them standing in a court of law and the judge saying, not guilty, you're free to go. What would you think of a judge like that? How can we trust a God who justifies the wicked? Well, take a look at Exodus 23, verse 7. We see God says, have nothing to do with false charge, 
with a false charge and do not put an innocent or honest person to death for I will not acquit the guilty. But isn't that what God's doing? Is this simply just God being good? Again, from Tozer, God spares us because He is good, but He could not be good if He were not just. God is just. He cannot acquit the guilty. But not only is He just, but God also loves you and me. He loves us. He hates sin. He loves the sinner. So what does He do? Well, God has taken the punishment for sin in His Son, Jesus Christ, so that we can go free. I don't understand it, do you? I mean, it's mind-blowing. Paul uses some important terms here to help us to picture what's going on here. So take a look at, uh, at your screen here. So the word uh, redemption that you see in this, in this uh, passage comes from the marketplace. It actually comes from the slave market. The idea is, or the picture here is, a slave who is up on the block and is about to be uh, sold when someone comes along and pays the full price so that that slave uh, can go free. Well, God handed over His own Son as that payment. He purchased us out of slavery. But rather than making us His slaves, He adopts us into His family and loves us as His children. But sin must be punished, and it is. Someone had to die for your sin, and God presented Jesus as a sacrifice of atonement. Now, you read in your notes, and some of you may even have in your, uh, in your uh, translation this word propitiation. Remember, God hates sin. He'll do anything to wipe out sin. It, it, the picture here is kind of like a, 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 a mother bear who is watching over her cubs, and something gets in between her and her cubs. That same ferocity, that desire to kill and destroy is just a glimpse. It's just a, a small picture of what God uh, is like when He thinks of sin. Because it, it's going to harm us. And remember, He loves us. So Jesus uh, is presented as a sacrifice of atonement. That is, when Jesus died on the cross, He satisfied God's justice. And the act of satisfying His justice turned aside the anger that was directed towards us. Now in the past, He left sins unpunished. To do that indefinitely would have been unrighteous and unjust. But at the cross, God Himself shows Himself to be righteous by taking the punishment of all sin on Himself. So Christ's death on the cross works on past sins, but it also works on our sins too. At the cross, God paid the price for us once and for all. There is no sin that God did not deal with on the cross. Think about that. There is no sin that God has not dealt with on the cross. He has done what we could never do. And get this, there's nothing more to be done. So how do we respond? Well, there's no place, Paul says, for boasting. The people of Rome and the religious Jews knew a thing or two about boasting. We're no different. We boast all the time, don't we? We boast about our skills. We boast about our, uh, our understanding of football. We boast about our teams, which we had nothing to do with. Uh, we boast about all manner of things. As religious people, we, we also boast, just like the, the Jewish Christians of the time. The only things that changed our status with God, though, is His action. We are forgiven sinners. And when we grasp this, when we fully grasp the fact that we're just forgiven sinners, all of us alike, well, we really, we really need to take on the attitude, a right attitude towards other people. How could we look at other people with some air of superiority when we recognize there's nothing that I've done that makes me special? It's everything that God did that put me where I am today. But this free gift is not automatic. So we have to accept it ourselves. When someone does something kind, though, we often want to contribute something. We want to pay back that kindness, don't we? We want to contribute 
anything. But there's nothing. Paul tells us three times in the passage. Do you see it? Take a look at the screen there. Verse 22 says, This righteousness is given through faith. Verse 25 says, To be received by faith. And then verse 26, The one who justifies those who have faith in Jesus. So we must accept God's gift by faith, simply to trust in Christ and His death. Now, if you're a believer, do you live with the assurance that everything God said He would do, He will do? Or do you want to add something to it? Do you feel like you're not ever going to be good enough and perhaps you might lose what you've been given? Listen. All that was necessary for our forgiveness has already been done. Already been done. Completely. There's nothing that we can contribute. Nothing that we can offer up. That's why religion is such a, a, a difficult thing. It, it, it responds to our natural inclination to try and do something. Anything. But as Paul said, it's just a wasted effort. Once you've put your trust in Jesus, nothing that you've ever done will make Him love you any less. Did you get that? Nothing that you've ever done will make Him love you any less. And get this, nothing that you ever do will make Him love you any more. For those who haven't accepted God's offer yet tonight, you may be asking, well, how... How can I become right with God? And I know that we've had some guys come up in the past few weeks that have made this choice, but I, I would suspect that there are a number of you guys out there that are still trying to decide, is this for me? Well, I think the first thing that you need to do is recognize that we're all sinners. I'm a sinner. Your leaders are sinners. The guys in your group are sinners. We're all sinners. We've all done the unspeakable sin of rejecting God. We've broken His law, and there's nothing that we can do about it. We stand condemned. But we also have to understand that we were redeemed. We were bought at a great price, the blood of Christ. We belong to Him now. When we accept Him as our Lord, we belong to Him. We become God's children. And once we get those two things then we need to respond. We respond to His free gift of forgiveness by faith in Jesus Christ. It's, it's the only way to do it. You know, as I, I heard a sermon on Sunday, I heard a quote that I thought was a fitting end note for this lecture tonight. John Newton was a former slave ship captain, and he penned perhaps one of the most well-known hymns, uh, Amazing Grace. We've sung it uh, often here in the men's study. And uh, he wrote at the end of his life the following words. I want you to listen to this. Although my memory is fading, I remember two things very clearly. I am a great sinner, and Christ is a great Savior. I mean, that... It just gives you chills, doesn't it? We stand before God as sinners. In a court of law, there's ample evidence. It's an airtight, open-shut case. The verdict has been passed. We are guilty. All we're waiting for is the sentence. Now, there is something you can do about that if you choose. You can roll the dice. And you can stand before God and give an account. But there's another way, the way, and that's to have faith that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, died on a cross to satisfy God's justice, to take His full force, the wrath of God, in our place. And the righteousness that God offers is transferred from His Son to us. Get that. Our sins were transferred to Jesus. His righteousness transferred to us. 
God put forward His Son in the slave market and bought our freedom. But He chose not to abuse us or call, or call us slaves, but instead to love us and call us children. So I don't know where you are tonight if you have already accepted this free gift. I, I pray that God would remind you and me alike of our place. Our place before the cross, our place after the cross. And remind us that there's no boasting in this. And, and motivate us to go out and share this gospel, this good news with people out there that have never heard it. People that are waiting for the sentence. If you haven't accepted that free gift tonight, I hope that you'll pray about it and consider it very seriously. In fact, uh, don't go to bed tonight if you're really questioning it. Get down on your knees and ask God to open the eyes of your heart that so He might reveal to you your position in Christ because of what Christ has done and all the inheritance, the glorious inheritance that waits for you. I'm not talking about, you know, the lotto in a worldly sense. I'm talking about the lotto in a heavenly sense. We're winners when we accept Jesus Christ. It's all waiting for you. All you have to do is confess your sins. Turn away from those sins. Turn towards God. Tell Him you believe that Jesus is who He says He is, that He did what He said He would do, and that He has done what we could never do. And accept it by faith. Pray with me. Well, Father, um, we've all experienced failure. We know what it's like to try and do the right thing and end up doing the wrong thing. We know that there's no way that we can satisfy your standard. But Father, there was a man who lived on this earth who did live a perfect life, who met every detail of your law perfectly. And somehow, Father, in your love and your mercy, you showed your righteousness by offering your Son to die for our sins, to take our sins on Himself and be punished as we should have been by dying on a cross. And yet His blood imputes into our lives the righteousness that is yours, that comes when we believe, when we trust, when we have faith in Jesus Christ. And so, Father, as we leave this place, if we're still considering, if we're still on the fence, Father, prick our hearts tonight. There's no way you can hear this message and not be brokenhearted for those that haven't heard this message and haven't responded. There's no way you can hear this message and not be ecstatic about what it means to us as we begin a life eternal with you. And Father, as we leave, also remind us that we have no right to feel superior towards anyone else. We all came from the same place, and if it wasn't for what you did, we'd all still be in that exact same place. That if we have anything to boast in, it's your Son, Jesus Christ, and what He's done. What He did on the cross did what we could never do once and for all. And it's in His precious name we pray. Amen.